it's really my pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening. Uh, I think we're in for a fun evening and a fun event. Uh, this is the 21st anniversary of our gala and celebration of sculpture. The highlight of our gala is the presentation of the Lifetime Achievement Award, and we have been honored to recognize many great sculptures, many of which Johanna just listed. Frank Stella, who we recognized last year with our award, is quoted as saying, what we see is what we see. This quote rings home tonight. It is because the people in this room are able to see what others are not. That's what makes ISC a special organization, and that's what makes tonight a special night for those that love sculpture. Now, as Johanna said, later tonight we'll honor Fernando Botero, whose vast contributions to the arts span more than six decades. But I would also like to thank, at this point, those whose support to ISC has meant so much to our success and as an organization, our success in this gala. Our gala sponsors tonight are Josh Cantor, Robert Duncan, and the Marlboro Gallery. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize three board members who have or will retire this year. David Handley, Mary Ellen Sherrill, and Steinem Thrensdowder. Uh, please join me in thanking David, Mary Ellen, and Steinem for their service to this great organization. Thank you. As is always uh, the case when we have board members that are leaving, we have new board members that are coming out on. Uh, Dee Dee Morrison, founder of Private Air Magazine and a sculptor focusing on public art, is a new board member, as is Carla Hansel, chief curator at the Mint Museum. The ISC looks forward to working with both of you in years to come. So at this point, please enjoy your evening, and the recognition program will begin after dinner. It's my privilege uh, tonight to introduce David Ebony. Uh, Mr. Ebony is the managing director of one of the most established art periodicals in the world, Art in America, where he has worked for almost 20 years. As a regular contributor to the magazine, he has signed over 450 articles, features, reviews, news stories, and interviews. He has written extensively on Latin American art and artists, and for the September 2012 issue of Art in America, he organized a special section devoted to Latin American art. Mr. Ebony is also a contributing editor and writer for Lacanian Inc., a journal on art and psychoanalysis. He is the author of numerous books on art, including Curve, Graham Sutherland, a retrospective for the Picasso Museum, Atibe, Craigie Horsfield, Revelation, and Botero, Abu Ghraib. We are pleased that he is joining to us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ebony to the podium. Thank you. Good evening. I'm David Ebony. I'm honored to be here tonight in the presence of one of the world's most significant artists. Fernando Botero is one of the rare few who have been able to invent a singular and personal visual language that is universally understood. For the most part, it's a language of pleasure, sensuality, and voluptuousness. Not fat. I think it was the American painter Paul Cadmus who said that an artist needs to exaggerate or no one will notice. Botero's work certainly gets noticed. Based as they are in direct observation, as well as Renaissance techniques, Botero's unique distortions, Botero morphs, as they have been affectionately called, are readily comprehensible and credible, no matter how outrageous and removed from reality the image might at first appear. Since relatively early on in his career, Botero has managed to be profound and popular at the same time. That's not an easy feat. Another of his significant achievements 
is that he was able to introduce into the international avant-garde discourse a way of working with figuration that is distinctly, persistently, and profoundly Latin American in character and temperament. For that, every artist from Latin America, no matter what kind of works they produce, owe Botero some level of gratitude for his efforts to thwart the bland conformity of mid-20th century global modernism. Of course, we are honoring Botero this evening because he's one of the few important painters to successfully transpose their 2D vision into a refined and coherent sculptural language of three dimensions. Luckily, we have the wonderful show of representative examples on view now at Marlborough on 57th Street to demonstrate Botero's imaginative play of volumes in space with some of his most iconic images. I was invited to speak here this evening as someone who also recognizes Botero as one of the most courageous artists of our time. My personal experience with the artist was while working on the book Botero Abu Ghraib, which was published by Prestel in 2006. As the stories and images of the atrocities and abuse of prisoners at Abu Ghraib at the Abu Ghraib facility near Baghdad first came to light in 2004, I was stunned that most contemporary artists remained silent on this subject. Except for Richard Serra and a few others, no one spoke out. Could the threat of terrorism have blinded so many artists like deers in headlights? Botero faced the issue of inhumanity and injustice in the most forceful way. A series of paintings and drawings he produced from, 19, from 2004 to 2006 depicted in graphic detail the horrors of Abu Ghraib. The series which he introduced in exhibitions in Europe and which he subsequently donated to the Berkeley Art Museum shocked many. But for some, it was no surprise. Botero had earlier produced a series of works railing against the gun violence in his native Colombia, drug and the devastating impact that the drug lords and the drug cartel were having on everyday life there. His work was implicated firsthand when in 1995, terrorists exploded a bomb at the feet of one of his monumental and beloved dove sculptures in a public square in Medellin, his hometown, killing and injuring many. Soon after Botero Abu Ghraib was published, I was invited to give a talk about these controversial works at the San Antonio Museum of Art where a Botero retrospective was on view. After the talk, a number of audience members came up to me in tears. And I witnessed firsthand the ability of Botero to move and motivate people. The passionate feelings that so many people have toward his work is astonishing. Whether he is conveying the joys or sorrows of life, everyone can recognize that Botero's vision encompasses a most humane view of humanity. Thank you. David, thank you for those uh, wonderful comments. 
It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce Pierre Levey. Mr. Levey was born in Paris and raised in Baritz by a family whose history and art and antique dealing stretches back to the 19th century. He began his career at Gallery Louis Leris, Paris, and then worked at the Marlboro Fine Arts in London. In the 1960s, and then on to Marlboro Gallery in New York since 1967, where he has served as president for over four decades. He currently oversees two gallery spaces in the estate of Avigdor Arica, Claudio Bravo, Jacques Lipschitz, Clement Meadmore, and George Rickey, as well as a growing public art program. Mr. LeVay represents a roster of over 35 artists, including Richard Estes, Red Grooms, Madolo Valdez, and past Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Magdalena Abakanoitz, and tonight's honoree, Fernando Botero, whose work he has exhibited since 1993. Please join me in wel welcoming Pierre to the podium. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is uh, nobody who deserves more the Lifetime Achievement Award for inter from uh, the International Sculptor Center than Botero. Botero was born in 1932, and he has his first museum exhibition in 1970 in Europe, in Germany. Approximately at that time, he joined the uh, Marlboro Gallery in uh, 19, and the first exhibition which we did was in 1972. In nine, around 1973, he started to do some sculpture. And his first, he started to make the casting of his pieces in Paris. In 19, around 1976, 77, during a, a visit in his studio, I mentioned to Fernando Pietra Santa. Pietra Santa is an extraordinary city near uh, Pisa and Luca, where we did a lot of work with Jacques Lipschitz. He created uh, in uh, Pietra Santa, the famous sculptor, which is before Columbia University, uh, law school, Belarofon Taming Pegasus, which is one of the largest sculptors which exists in America, absolutely gigantic. And um, uh, Noguchi was working here. Uh, Henry Moore was working here. Even Napoleon, when uh, he conquested Italy, put one of his uh, generals in charge of the Andrew uh, foundry, uh, not, it's not exactly a foundry, where uh, people uh, do some uh, stone sculpture. It's near Carrara. It's an extraordinary place where um, Michelangelo used to live and where uh, he did, uh, he worked on the Pieta. Fernando adopted that place. And I always remember the first trip we, we went together to Pietra Santa. So we had, uh, and Fernando took with him two small plaster to let them to try to see if we could work in Pietra Santa. So he left the two plaster in. Uh, uh, to, he did not take them with him, he left them as a luggage. So we arrived in Milano, and the two plaster did not arrive. So it was quite embarrassing to lose two plaster in which he has worked quite a lot. So we had to wait to the Milan airport, which is one of the most inconvenient airports in the world, until the sculptor arrived. So the sculptor arrived, fortunately, 
in the next plane, about three or four hours later. And uh, we drove to Forte di Marme, which is very near from uh, Pietra Santa. And uh, the uh, sculptor at last arrived. And uh, since then, um, uh, Fernando has, uh, the, I mean, has become the king of Pietra Santa after Michelangelo. And uh, the foundries here, where he works, absolutely extraordinary. It's an artisanal world, and people do sculpture, and near the sculpture you have, uh, uh, they cultivate peaches and tomatoes. And uh, it's absolutely extraordinary to go with Fernando to see this beautiful sculpture which is executing and to see the way they are doing that with the great love. The career of Fernando has been absolutely exceptional. The monumental sculpture which he has done have been exhibited all over the world. He had a show in the Champs-Élysées in Paris, which has never been done before, with 31 sculptors in 1992-1993. In New York, there was a, a big show at uh, the um, uh, uh, Park Avenue with approximately 19 sculptors. In spite of the show took place 20 years ago, people still remind that and think that is the best show which has ever been done in uh, Park Avenue. The show was shown also in the United States, in Chicago, Los Angeles, and Washington DC in Constitution Avenue. The, he has shown in Monaco, in Madrid, in La Castellana, which is the most important place to show in Spain. He has shown in uh, Lisbon, in Venice, in Berlin. He had two shows in Florence. The first at the Forte di Belvedere, which is one of the most beautiful castles in uh, Italy. Then in 1999, in uh, the um, famous Piazza de la Signoria, near the Uffizi, and near the David of Michelangelo. No artist has had so many shows in prestigious city in the world than Fernando, and it's absolutely remarkable. And also you have some uh, sculptors which are uh, spread out in magnificent spaces all over the world. And he gave a, a big collection of his monumental sculpture in uh, his hometown, Medellin. And uh, uh, he just had a show for his 80th birthday organized by his daughter at the Instituto Nacional de Bellas Artes in Mexico. And uh, the paintings and the sculpture were uh, being so powerful that nobody was looking at the murals by Diego Rivera, or Orozco, or Siqueiros. Uh, why does Fernando is so successful? Uh, first of all, it's absolutely unique. Or no, it's impossible to stay indifferent before his pieces. Or you love them, or you hate them. Fortunately, there is much more people who love them than people who hate them. And uh, uh, for example, uh, when we had the show in Madrid, the, uh, there was a group of people, so-called intellectual, which were this guy in Giacometti. They did not realize that it was a marvelous homage to Fernando, because Giacometti was doing thin people, and him is doing fatter people than Giacometti. So it was a certain extent a 
uh, reconnaissance of uh, what he was doing. And uh, in uh, Medellin, they had a uh, sculptor uh, which was destroyed. This one was maybe something political, but it shows that there are some people which sometimes hate what he's doing. You know, the, uh, the writer, the great French poet Baudelaire, has said that genius for an artist involves the invention of a cliché. Fernando, cl cliché means to create something which become obvious and something which is systematically repeated. And I think that uh, Fernando has created this kind of cliché. Everybody, uh, whenever you speak to some people, people will say this man looks like a Botero. So what he does is really a, um, let's say, epiphenomena of what you recognizable and uh, he will stay as a man who has invented a category of image which nobody forgets. Botero has invented a world full of men, women, animals, which are absolutely unique. The other great reason why Fernando is a great artist, because he has created an extremely body of work where the formal qualities of his work are absolutely exceptional. He defined volumes like nobody has done recently. He has the qualities which you can find of his painting. His um, equilibrium, his classicism is uh, great. It's why people, when they see the piece, they did not even they look at the image, but they don't realize how the image has been created and how harmonious it is. And um, uh, the, everything is composed in a very eclectic and uh, like geometry a certain extent. You know, it's a kind of uh, mixture between, uh, you know, um, it has a relationship, a certain extent, from time to time, with a great master of the 19th century, like Canova. But you can think, when you see his work of the Greek, Greek Kouros or uh, Etruscan art. The pre-Columbian work is very good. And what is great also is not a realist artist. He creates some prototype of artist. He's not painting or sculpting something which uh, is related to any individual. He is also a very courageous person who uh, is uh, relatively critical of what is happening now. Whenever you look of art, uh, a work of art now, it's extremely difficult to understand it. Sometimes you need some uh, explanation written around the, the work in order to understand what, is, uh, what the artist is about. For him, you know, you see the work, you get involved with the work without any explanation. And uh, he's uh, fighting, swimming alone against cur current contemporary art world. And it's a very courageous attitude. So congratulations, Fernando.
Pierre, thank you very much. Uh, the ISC Board of Directors established the Lifetime Achievement Award in 1991 to recognize individual sculptures who have made exemplary contributions to the field of sculpture. Candidates are masters of the sculptural process and techniques who have devoted their career to a laudable body of work, as well as to the advancement of the field as a whole. When selecting a Lifetime Achievement Award winner, attributes that are assessed include the quality of the work, the impact and the influence of their work, a sense of dedication and commitment to the field of sculpture, and a generosity of spirit with other sculptors. I think that we can all agree Fernando Botero is an outstanding choice for this year's award. It is my pleasure to present the International Sculpture Center's Lifetime Achievement Award to Fernando Botero. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the International Sculpture Center and its executive director, Johanna Hutchinson, for this prestigious award. I feel truly honored tonight. For me, this, is lifetime, this Lifetime Achievement Award is nothing less than a recognition of my love of form and volume, a passion that has inspired and guided my entire career for over 65 years, first in painting and drawing, and then in sculpture since 1970. My work as a sculpture is done mostly in a noble and durable material, which is bronze. We, all, we have all heard of magnificent sculptures found at the bottom of the ocean or buried deep in the ground they rescue after thousands of years in perfect condition and this proves this material endurance, strength, and nobility. So the material I use to make my sculptures is bronze. The process is a low wax casting, and I create most of my sculptures in Pietrasanta, Italy, where you can find some of the best founders in the world. My subject matter springs mostly from my homeland which is Latin America, yet my inspiration as a sculpture also come from primitive Europe, European cultures, pre-Columbian art, and even popular art with its unexpected and surprising formal proposal. Additionally, I have had the great fortune of being able to exhibit my monumental sculptures in more than 20 cities and capital of cultures around the world. These are magnificent spaces, and it has been an honor to show my work there. The first one of these exhibitions was in Monte Carlo in 1981, and then in the Champs-Élysées in Paris, where I showed 32 monumental sculptures. Later, it was Park Avenue in New York, Michigan Avenue in Chicago, Paseo de la Castellana in Madrid, the Piazza de la Signoria in Florence, the Grand Canal in Venice, the Lunds Garten in Berlin, and important streets, parks, and plazas in Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul, Stockholm, Mexico City, Lisbon, Copenhagen, Santiago de Chile, and many more. Thank you. However, what I find truly unique about this exhibition is not only the spectacular settings where my sculptures have been placed, but that here something different has occurred. Instead of a limited number of art lovers having to visit the museum, the gallery, or the gardens to view and experience the work of art, this exhibition has been placed among the people located in the very heart of their public spaces, precisely where they stroll, drive, and walk to their jobs or back to their homes. This was a new concept, one that had not been done before. To conclude, allow me to say that I believe that one of life's greatest privileges is to be able to live doing what we most enjoy. There is no doubt that I have been blessed with the good fortune 
of being able to dedicate my entire life and energy, energy to this amazing passion which is creating art. Nothing brings more happiness and enjoyment and nothing more and nothing for me is more fulfilling. Thank you so much.